I was asked to share a fun fact, and so that's why I sort of talked to Jessica about my, uh, my upcoming tape release, actually. We keep this like totally retro. And it's with, a, with an acoustic accordion that we hacked to become an electronic instrument. We put microphones on the inside and play it through like guitar paddles for distorted sound. Our neighbors hate us. They absolutely <laughs> hate us. Um, and it's a very quiet taste, so I'm sure that, I mean, I think most of you are probably quite relieved without knowing it that I'm not going to play music today. So <laughs> um, instead, I'm going to talk about, um, well, my title is The Humble Data Scientist, The Art and Essence of Data Science. And it will become clear very soon why I chose that title. Um, but first, um, when, when Jared asked me to sort of come and speak here, I thought, it's my first time actually at this conference, so it's really great. And when he, when he asked me to speak, I was like, this is great. Like, we just finished uh, at Fast Forward uh, a deep dive, a technical deep dive on probabilistic programming which is a set of techniques that makes Bayesian inference more accessible. Um, and we also built a prototype to predict real estate prices in New York City, where we sort of use Bayesian inference to really give those predictions at a very fine-grained scale. Um, it's not, well, it's not, it's interesting to look at. It's somewhat scary because the speed of gentrification, I know I'll be pushed out of Bushwick very soon. Um, so, um, Instead, I decided to talk about three papers, uh, very sort of classic papers in computer science that I happened to read recently. Um, and by the way, I do hope that there's a worst title award because I do believe I fully own this. If you look at this program, I've like strike throughs and everything in there. So um, I do hope that, that uh, I get a prize for the worst title. Um, it was inspired by three sort of classic papers. Uh, the, the humble programmer, um, computer programming is an art, and no silver bullet, essence and accident in software engineering. The first two are actually transcripts of Turing Award acceptance speeches. Uh, the Turing Award, for people who don't know that, it's kind of like the Nobel Prize in computer science. Um, Fred Brooks, uh, this is not a transcript of sort of his Turing, Turing Award acceptance speech, but he did win one in 1999. And anyone who hasn't read these papers, I fully recommend reading them. They're beautiful, the language is beautiful, and really what they are, they're sort of a, a meditation on uh, computer programming, on, on what it sort of like means to write code. How do we think about writing code? And it covers both the technical aspects as well as what it means to work together to produce solutions. Um, and sort of why, why did I decide to talk about this today? Well, a lot of the lessons that they learned in computer, uh, computer science and software engineering in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, I think that we as data scientists can learn from them today. We're a very young discipline. We are sort of maturing. And uh, this is a time when I think uh, we can learn from history. Um, and here's, here's why, here's one motivation. I often talk to people who are sort of looking to get into data science. I myself made this transition from academia to data science. I get many people that come to me, it's like, help, how do I do that? And here's a, a worry that, that I often hear. Is data science a good career choice? The community is constantly adding better tools and data science platforms. Soon, everyone will be able to do data science and the profession data scientist will cease to exist. Um, maybe some of you in the audience have that worry, right? Is this profession actually going to be as lucrative as it is today? Well, what's funny about it is that they had the same sentiment in, in software engineering. And in those days, one often encountered the naive expectation that once more powerful machines were available, programming would no longer be a problem. Programming is a solved problem, right? Like, no one, no one is paying like software engineers anymore, right? What happened instead, right? This is where I say we can learn from history is uh, the sort of discipline had it into what was uh, called the, the crisis of software engineering. The term was first coined in 1968 at a NATO conference on software engineering. So this was really a probably very dry uh, a meeting. <laughs> but I like the sort of dramatic term. Um, why, why did they talk about the crisis in software engineering in the sort of late 60s? The number of software projects that took way longer than planned and that went way over budget, that never delivered a solution or delivered a solution that no one had asked for, had started to increase really quite significantly. And that was really in very stark contrast to the belief that programming was about to become easy. So why did that happen? To put it quite bluntly, as long as there were no machines, programming was no problem at all. When we had a few weak computers, programming became a mild problem, and now that we have gigantic computers, programming has become a gigantic problem. 
my speaker screen disappeared. So, um, is that the, the tech people? Yeah. So, um, basically, what happened is uh, there was an increase in, in hardware. Hardware became so powerful that it basically started to enable many more software engineering projects at a, at a complexity that beforehand just wasn't possible. And alas, the progress in software engineering wasn't happening at quite the same pace. And that's not because progress was slow. It's just like in hardware, progress was incredibly fast, which, I mean, we now know, know as Moore's law. Um, but also it was because in software engineering, people misidentified what was hard about software engineering. And so let me illustrate. We all think we know what a bicycle looks like, right? And yet when we attempt to draw one, this is actually not too bad, right? When we attempt to draw one and then render it to look like a real bike, things are starting to look a little weird. <laughs> Can someone tell me what's hard about this bike? Why it would be, hmm? The is yeah, and it would be very hard to actually like, <laughs> steer, right? So, um, so as, as creatures, as humans, it's a very sort of fundamental point, right? We encounter friction when we start implementing our ideas, when we start making them real, when we start writing a program, and when we start to analyze data. So because of that, because that is the point where we first become aware of friction, we blame the world, um, we blame the tools we happen to use and not our ideas. They seem so great, and it's just the world that isn't cooperating. So we blame the wood that is starting to splinter as we are starting to build a table, the programming language is awkward, the data, well, but really what's hard about data science is not really how to know how to use convnets for image classification or recurrent neural networks to write movie scripts, although if you haven't seen Sunspring, this movie script was written by a recurrent neural network. It's really funny and you should check it out. But that's sort of a side note. What is really hard about data science is finding good problems to solve and then uh, you, and, and with all the hype around neural networks or any other sort of shiny object that you sort of want to insert here, right? Like, we must not forget that it is not our business to make programs. It is our business to design classes of computation that will, design, uh, that will display a desired behavior or to find good, effective solutions only as complex as the problem desires, no more and no less, using the tools that are part of the data science and machine learning toolbox. And why am I saying that? <laughs> why sort of why am I standing here and like meditating on these three papers? It is because at Fast Forward, um, we sort of like explore new and emerging technologies and we write these reports and we build prototypes and that's all really great. But we also work with clients and we try to help them to use those tools within their own organizations to solve real complex problems, often in collaboration with many different people on very short timelines. Um, and what we see there is just like a, a set of problems that come up and up again, why these teams don't quite manage to find effective solutions. And one is that I often see the teams are choosing a tool before they understand their problem well enough to actually understand what's the best tool to use. Um, again, an analogy here. So, for example, if you decide that you want to use a hammer, right? And then you realize that actually what you need to do is like cut a piece of string. Well, a hammer is no good for that, right? Um, maybe you decided to use a chainsaw. You can use a chainsaw to cut a piece of yarn, but it is a little much, right? So, <laughs> so what's hard about data science is really knowing how to take open-ended problems and turning them into a set of problem statements one can answer using tools from the data science and machine learning toolbox. And one way of getting there is like, Always, always know what success means to you and your problem. And the problem is that success typically doesn't come neatly formulated as accuracy or R square. Um, problems don't come neatly formulated like that. This is a, um, a sort of masked version of a problem that I sort of like recently, a problem statement that was posed to me. Our discretionary traders consume vast amounts of information, sell-side research, earning call transcripts, transcripts and materials from trade conferences, and the daily news. They cannot read everything. They don't want to miss anything. They suffer from major FOMO. They are trained to question every piece of information that is put in front of them. Using data science and machine learning, how can we build a system that services relevant news items to our traders? Deep learning, LDA, I mean, those are not answers to it, right? And, and there are many, many different things that are hidden in the statement. One is, well, unsupervised learning is probably not going to cut it because what they're looking for is incredibly specific to their trade. It is very hard to find. This is like the tiniest needle in the haystack. Something else that wouldn't really work is 
like you can't just give them an answer without an explanation. They are trained to question. They really want to do their job right, so they need to trust you. They need to trust your solution. You probably need to talk them a little bit through the processes that you're using. You need to find a solution that is able to explain why it services the predictions at a surface, why a certain piece of, of news might be relevant. And so there are many different problems that are hidden in this statement. And it is not easy to tease apart, like, OK, what are the different components? What solution can I build for each component? And crucially, what it, what it requires, I think, is empathy, and that was something that was mentioned in JD's talk yesterday, which I really liked. Um, and he mentioned user stories. Um, here's sort of my little take on user story. Um, <clears throat> he mentioned user stories, and what's interesting is that like user stories are basically part of sort of this whole like set of agile methodologies. And the software engineering crisis that I spoke about at the beginning, it is often credited with actually giving birth to a lot of these like agile techniques, and that is because. At that point, because hardware became more powerful, it enabled more complex projects, more people worked together. And so they needed different processes to actually manage those kind of teams. There was a different communication that was needed and so forth. Um, and I would say that we're seeing a very similar movement right now in data science because our key enabler for our discipline, which is data, is increasing in a very similar way. So what's possible? is starting to increase, and that's incredibly exciting, and there's so much that we can do, but I do think that there can be, there can be sort of risks, and I, I feel that in, in my sort of work, as I work with fast forward clients, I can see those little signs um, that sort of point to where things could potentially really go wrong. Um, so is Agile um, the solution for this? Um, not really, and I'm sure like a lot of you work in, in, in places where you might work sort of alongside software engineers who are using Agile, and there's typically a bit of friction between sort of data science teams and software engineering teams because that process isn't quite right. And why? Because, again, an analogy, but software engineers are sort of like architects. So they're, they're beholden to the laws of physics and gravity and such as their limitations on their work, but within those laws, there's essentially no limit what they can build. Their imagination is really the main limiting factor then. So they're creators, they build, they grow software and the products and the capabilities that it enables. Data scientists, on the other hand, we are true scientists. And as scientists, it is our job to learn about the world, to systematize knowledge, to uncover laws, knowledge and laws that ultimately power decisions and new data products. So what happens to me often is like a business asks, like, can I build this product? this data product, and I go, like, well, now the problem is that you, you can't actually give an answer before you look at the data. You sort of have a chicken and egg problem, right? And, and that is like the fundamental difference, really, between software engineering and data science. You have to manage an uncertainty that arises because your work is connected much more tightly to the real world, the world where we are today, than the work of a software engineer. And that is because you have to uncover and systematize reality that then can power data solutions. Um, and managing that uncertainty that is sort of at the heart of the difference between software engineering and data science. And the data science process really needs to, needs to be built around that. Um, and so three simple rules, really. And, and they seem very simple, but doing that in practice is really hard. Um, but one is identify assumptions about the world that need to be true for your solution to work, even before you start working with the data. Just think critically about what you're trying to build and what needs to be true in the world for that to be possible. And then rank your assumptions according to how critical they are for your solution. And the one that's really going to break whatever you're trying to build, that is the one that you're going to test first. And you're going to test it with the simplest experiment possible. Because all that you need is you need to get a little more confidence in your belief that that assumption is true about the real world and that therefore you can build that product. And why is this important? Because it is really important, as sort of Sandy said, and I really love to talk here, to work on projects that are risky, right? Because we do want to work, we want to create novel products, and for that we inherently sort of have to be ambitious, and we should be ambitious. But if you work on something that's risky, it is going to fail sometimes. If you never fail, it just means that you're not ambitious enough, that you're sort of not really setting your goals high enough. Right? But what's important is that you have to fail fast. And that is what Agile is designed to do. But we have to modify that process for data science to work. And this is what, in my experience, has worked the best in order to get to failure fast if that is something 
that will happen. Because if, if the world doesn't cooperate, it will eventually happen. So make sure that it happens quickly and not in three months down the line. And I care honestly, personally, less about maybe the money or the time that's spent. But it's really demoralizing for a team if you've worked on something for like a long time and then it, it just doesn't really work out, right? And that is actually what I care most about to sort of like prevent, prevent that sort of disappointment. And I can only imagine like after a two-day hackathon when you basically manage to write a whole manuscript, what a boost in morale that was for a team. That's fantastic and that's what we should aim for, right? And I wanna conclude on, on three inequalities, <laughs> right? So reluctance to engage with the business doesn't make you a nerd. It just means that you actually don't know what success means for your project. And we all know, like anything that we do, we're optimizing, right? We're always optimizing. If you don't know what success is, you actually you can't optimize, right? So you have to talk to people. Um, the use of a shiny tool doesn't mean that you're solving a hard problem. And the use of a shiny tool also doesn't mean that you're a smart data scientist. <laughs> Right, I think that's actually quite important. Why though do we see so many deep learning approaches everywhere? Sometimes they're very appropriate and people should really use them. But there's a one tiny remark that I wanna leave this on and that is, I think because our incentives on hiring are messed up and if anyone wants to like fix that, please do. <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> and that's it from me, thank you.